So dear friends, a very warm welcome to all of you once again for this afternoon session. And I hope it would not be too heavy because this is the second afternoon session of this wonderful program that we are having. A program that is wonderful precisely because we are learning so many things with our Chinese friends with us here present. And um, while we reflect upon these realities, we are also going to help not just ourselves, but we're helping also the church, the universal church and the Christian faith at large. Um, being the moderator of this session is very special for me. Why? Because as you see, perhaps you may recognize me very easily, like I'm from India. I'm an Indian. So on the one hand, I feel a bit sandwiched between China and the West. <laughs> if you if you want to look at it that way, sandwiched would be not a good perspective. But from the other side, from another perspective, I could see myself as a mediator between China and the West. It's all about perspectives. And that's what we are learning, you know, in all these reflections from yesterday. Uh, and, and now for this session, uh, the topic is simply wonderful, especially for those um, who are living Christianity in the East. Uh, Far East, Near East. It's the inculturation of Christianity in the Chinese society. So the first speaker is uh, Professor Jean-Paul Wiest. Uh, Professor Jean-Paul Wiest received a license in sacred theology from the Jesuit faculty of Egenhoven, Belgium. He then taught at Fujian Catholic University, Taiwan, excuse my Chinese pronunciations, where he learned Chinese and went on to earn a doctorate in Chinese history at the University of Washington in Seattle, USA. Subsequently, he taught at the Mary Knoll School of Theology in Osinin, New York, and directed their mission research center and their society history program for some 20 years. He frequently went to mainland China to collaborate with Chinese scholars on research projects and be of service to Chinese priests and sisters. In 1999, he took residence in China to better fulfill this work. From 2003 to 2011, he was research director at the Beijing Center for Chinese Studies. He has published extensively in English, French, and Chinese. Over to you, Professor Jean-Paul. Thank you. It's my pleasure and honor to be able to be part of this uh, conference. Um, first of all, we have been talking about inculturation for quite a while now. And um, I think it's, it's time to try to find a standard official definition to inculturation. And this is the one I found in uh, the encyclical uh, Redemptorist Mission. So, inculturations, as you can see from uh, the text itself, is a slow process resulting of encounters, exchanges between the original bearer who transmit the good news and the receiver who translate the message and integrate it into his or her own culture. So I don't want to enter into the debate whether other terms such as contextualizations, indigenizations, sinicizations are more suited to the Chinese experience. But I believe that inculturation is ultimately contextual, arising from a specific historical context and addressing that context. Recently, scholars like uh, Dr. Zheng, Zheng Yangwen in his recent book, 
synthesizing Christianity, and also the very recent, just released April issue of China Source Quarterly, entitled Contextualization and the Chinese Church. They already have very aptly described and analyzed several of the facets of what it means to enculture Christianity in a specific Chinese milieu or context. So in this expose, rather than repeating what they have already said, my aim is to shed some additional light, share some insights, and hopefully bring some understanding of the process a few steps further. I draw on my own experience as a researcher to illustrate how, within different contexts and despite considerable past and present hurdles, this process of inculturations has taken place and continue to do so, enabling expressions of Christianity, genuinely Chinese, to emerge and flourish. And so I, out of those different contexts, I've chosen six. I will go very quickly through the first five because some of the speakers already touch upon it, uh, to spend more time at the end on the present situations. So the first, um, I have to, the, f the first context has to do, I entitle it, Inculturation, the Religion of the Light and Chinese Philosophy. It has to do with the, the first arrival of Christianity in China that we know about, 645, what I call the religions of the light, or Jingjiao, okay? So when, when they arrive, and uh, as uh, Professor Yang Huilin uh, mentioned, it seemed that they were able very quickly to insert themselves into the Chinese culture, the Chinese religious culture of the time by using a vocabulary uh, borrowed from Taoism, from uh, uh, Buddhism, and so on. So this was already mentioned. All what I want to do is to add a little bit by looking at the famous Xi'an stele, sometimes called the Nestorian stele, but I don't like that, uh, that term because I don't consider them being Nestorians. They were just representative of another form of Christianity that came from the East, the Church of the East. What is interesting, uh, what is interesting about that still, if we look at it now, um, <coughs> here is a rubbing of it, is the top of it, that cross. You see that cross? This cross has little bubbles on the sides. You see those? And on the top, you have a flaming light. The religions of the light, they call them the religion of the light. But this flaming um, light, it's also a symbol of uh, Taoism, in, in a sense, the flaming pearl of Taoism. Then on the side of the cross, you have also those bushes and clouds and so on, which is in some way is representative of what Taoism is all about, that closeness to nature. Man is not above nature is within it. Then you look at that cross, where is it arising from? It arises from a lotus flowers. So here in, in, in a sense, it seems that the religion of the light that came understood, understood that Christianity has to be part of the Chinese culture. And they skillfully set it within 
the fundamental spiritual image of ancient China. The cross is coming out of the lotus flowers of Buddhism and embracing the Taoist culture. So this is it. This is beautiful, especially for us from the Western point of view. Oh, we say, wow, this is really uh, magnific, beautiful in t uh, inculturation process. But then how comes? In 1845, there is a persecution um, against all the foreign religions, against Buddhism, against this religion of the light. But two years after, Buddhism flourished, but not the religion of the light. What happened? This is the question. How comes? How comes it, it fell? Never revived? You know, so some scholars said, oh, because they were Nestorians, heretic, and so on. No, no, I don't think so. I think the real reason is that they lack. They lack, and you see on the picture over there, uh, the text, Syrian text, that give the name of the monks of the Syrian church. And they are most of them Syrians. And they are none of them are really of any importance among the Chinese people. So I think it was the lack of a Chinese leadership. Once the foreign monks and bishops were sent away, and were not able to come back because of problems along the, the Silk Road and so on, then that Chinese church didn't, didn't have a strong enough Chinese leadership to survive. And uh, it disappeared. So that raises also a question when you look at other culture or later on China. And I ask myself, you know, it's a kind of sad ending. How comes uh, a, a church was not able to survive by itself? And in the sense, it's in kind of sharp context with the steadfast perseverance century la later of persecuted Chinese and Japanese Catholic that were able to survive without uh, uh, a priesthood uh, or, or leadership or missionaries among them. Okay, so this, this is one, one point I want to, to bring to you. The second one, I call it inculturations, native preachers, preachers in their local social network. And that happened when I was researching Christianity and the return of the missionaries in the 1840 in the southern China, Guangdong in particular, and I discovered that before the missionaries were able to come back, well, they were already native preachers that came back and prepared the ground from the missionaries. Who were they? I discovered about 19 of them. They were Hakka people, mostly, and uh, that part of Guangdong is very poor, so they went to find work in uh, Southeast Asia, which is today Malaysia, Singapore, and so on, were converted. And then when the Daoguang Emperor, about 1845, allowed Christianity to, to the Chinese citizens to be Christians, well, they decided to come back as missionaries to their own people in China. And so one of them, I, Kyo Tech Nyuk, it's a Hakka, Hakka name, um, for 15 years, went back to his native village of Dayang, and for 15 years, talked to his relatives, talked to the clan related to his relative, and was able to spread. Christianity in all those different places. And one of the things, the, the tactic, if you could call it, he used, is that one of his first converts was a peddler going from market town to market town <coughs> selling his ware, and at the same time, preaching the good news. 
And he did the same thing with the, the lady seamstresses that also went from village to village to, to, to help. And they did a tremendous work among the Chinese women in converting them. So this is one example. I use another example uh, later on, but I won't talk too much about it. It's about Bibiana. This is a completely different part of China. If we are in Manchuria, near Shenyang now, over there, the village of Urbadan. She saw her mother being killed by the boxer as she was 18, and then she decided to become a Jujada, uh, a living at home virgin. And um, for 25 years before missionary came back, she took care of everything having to do with Christianity, preaching to the, to the children, arranging matrimonial uh, ties, uh, keeping the records in line, and even starting the formation of young women to possibly become uh, uh, sisters later on. And so she, she picked up, she found eight, eight of them, and among those eight of them, six of them later on became sisters and were the first six sisters of uh, the native sisters of the sacred heart of the former diocese of Fuxun in, in China. So this, this, this is beautiful to, to see. And that, that, that face really was very strong, well put in, I would say, uh, one of the best examples I, I had is when in 2015, I went to that, to that uh, village of Urbadan uh, where they celebrated the 120th anniversary of the introduction of Christianity in, in their village. And here you had, you know, in the, in the front, some of the, the sisters and uh, a congregation of, of over 100 people, strong face. <coughs> Uh, my third example will be, uh, I entitled it, The Wisdom of China Ancient Sage and the Religion of Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. This is based on persecution and the killing of Christians during the Boxer Rebellion. And when I study that, I, I kind of find out that before the Boxer Rebellions, in that part of Hebei over there, there was a kind of uh, understanding, respect, between the Christian village and the non-Christian village. They all seemed to abide to what we will call the golden rule of dealing kindly with one another. Right? Don't do to others what you don't want others to do unto you the analects, or the sage is kind to the kind, he is also kind to the unkind, for virtue is kind, Tao Te Ching. And then of course, you have uh, the gospel, look, do to others as you would have them to do unto you. So then the boxers' uh, rebellions happened, uh, the, the Christians are accused to be allied with the foreigners and disrupting the feng shui and all these kind of things. And so they, they are persecuting. A, a lot of villages are being destroyed or, and so on. And one of them in particular that caught uh, my attention is, um, just to hold on that I, I found myself where I am here. <laughs> Uh, it is uh, that village of Xiaohangsun, Xiaohangsun, which is uh, just uh, south of uh, Beijing, uh, the area of uh, Jindong. Uh, in that village, uh, there was a, a Kung Fu master, Christian. And he had trained a lot of uh, young people for the art of Kung Fu and so on. But what happened during the Boxer Rebellion is one of his best disciples became a boxer and one of the leaders. And as the Kung Fu master 
called Lao Wang, the old Wang, uh, was a way they, they killed most of the people in the village, and especially the family of Lao Wang. Then two years later, that disciple who was native of that village of Xia Hansun wanted to come back and talk to the new pastor of that village that happened to be Father Vincent Leb, Lei Mingyuan. Uh, and Lei Mingyuan talked to Lai Wang and said, you are Christians. We are the religions of forgiveness. Would you be willing to receive your, answer, uh, your old disciple back? And Lai Wang agreed. And when the disciple came, they saw he came and embraced him. And later on, when that disciple converted, became his godfather. So I think in, in, in that, that image is, is, is a very powerful one. And this story and many other examples of Christian forgiveness toward the boxers and their misguided act of killing, killing were very important factors in the early part of the 20th century in the rapid spread of Christian faith and the return to peace in many parts of northern rural China. Christianity, by being the religions of mercy, proved that it practiced to, to their fullest the words of China most revered, revered sages. Uh, the, the next one I entitled it Inculturation and the Educated Elite, Ma Xianpo and his circle of friends. When we talk about Christian scholars and so on, immediately we think about Xu Guangqi. Well, Xu Guangqi was the linchpin. It was the beginning of a long line of uh, Christian scholars, and in this early part of uh, late uh, 19th century, early part of the 20th century, Ma Xianpo is really the great figure, I, I feel. He was born in 1840, uh, educated very traditional Confucian way, but at the age of 12, he, he goes to Shanghai uh, to visit his uh, sister and then uh, enter a newly open uh, school uh, run by the Jesuit that and finally became become a Jesuit and, 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 and so on and receive a full Western theological and uh, I would say traditional scholarly Culture. So you, you see a man that is at ease very well in the two Chinese and Western culture and at the same time deeply rooted from the theological point of view. Now, I don't want to go into the, the very colorful life of uh, Ma Xianpo, but suffice to say that through so that kind of intellectual and spiritual maturations, he, he became... Um, this led him to, uh, to believe in a kind of symbiotic relation between education, nationalism, and moral value rooted in Christianity. So as a Catholic, one of the, the words you, you find most often in his writing is he wants he want to spread the gongjia uh, uh, Jing Sen, uh, the spirit of uh, Catholicism. Uh, and, and so he wants that spirit of Catholicism to become the moral foundations of modern education and modernization of China. We are in the early part of the 20th century here. Uh, among his uh, good friends, younger friends that he helped, in a sense, to, to convert, was another uh, big uh, scholar. Uh, here is my shampoo. 
Yin Lianzhi. Yin Lianzhi is was a younger scholar, and here, we, we, well, you know, uh, Li Tiangang is a, a specialist of uh, on Ma Xiangpo and Yin Lianzhi and so on. So, but I, I still dare to to speak about in front of you. Um, uh, so Yin Lianzhi uh, was uh, the founder of one of the leading newspaper of China, Da Gongbao. And as a young man, he got in touch with Ma Xiangpo, and Ma Xiangpo encouraged him to read uh, the writing of the early Jesuit. And in the process, he converted and with Ma Xiangpo became a, a very early advocate of that spirit of Catholicism that you should permeate Chinese education and the modernization in, uh, of China. Then the third person that goes with that is not Chinese, although he took Chinese nationalities in 1927, is Father Vincent Lemming Yuan. And Lemming Yuan with England work toward that effort of, of uh, discussing social and moral issues in the light of the gospel. And he and Ying Lianzhi uh, started those Tianjin Lectures uh, Conference, which attracted a lot of people because they talked about contemporary issues, but in the light of the gospel. Uh, one thing led to the other, and they said, well, we also need some press some to, 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 that we can diffuse the good news of the gospel, but anchored into the problem of modern China. And so in, on, uh, on the national day of October 10, 1925, they launched one of the most uh, famous uh, newspaper and the first Catholic daily newspaper in China, Ishaba. This was an instant success among Christians as well as non-Christians. So I, I, I mention all that to show to show you this this effort of uh, if you want adapting. Um, making Christianity part of the Chinese culture, coming out non, not just out of missionary effort, but coming out from the Chinese Christians uh, themselves. Uh, this later on led to also to uh, the, the founding of the famous university, Catholic University of China, Fujian, in 1925. It took, quite, it took quite a while to, to have it going on. Um, but Ma Xiangpo, at that, at, this is Ishabao, and uh, Ma Xiangpo refused to become the president. He was already more than 80, 85 years old. By the way, he lived 100 years old. Uh, but he dedicated the rest of his life to keep on trying, pushing that idea that there was no opposition between uh, Confucianism and uh, Christianity. And this is one of his saying. Now, uh, I, I will skip one, one because we are in half time. Uh, one of the other examples I give is on Christian devotions, popular religiosity and art appreciation. But just to give you an idea, I can run some of the pictures uh, that will give you this idea. And, and one is a famous painting here in Rome. Uh, but you see the Chinese adaptation of it, the impact of uh, Costantini. Um, then in 1937, the Catholic uh, Shanghai Guide Ah, you can see again that that picture is very Chinese coming coming into play. But when I said what 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 is strange is that 
today, the Chinese Christian, the bulk of the Chinese Christian, have still remained very, very traditional. And part of the reason may be that from 1935 on, this was a period of disruption within China. And so they clang to what they had received from the missionary from the beginning. So this is a traditional rural church in China. If you go to, to Nantang and look into uh, the place where you can buy uh, Chinese souvenir and so on, it's all, all very, very, very traditional. Effort today, yeah, there are some effort, like Zhang Wei, huh? but a lot of the Chinese find this uh, too much like uh, Guanyin. And then uh, one of the sad example, maybe it is the stained glasses in the cathedral of, uh, of Shanghai that were kind of modern, but have been removed now. Okay. Uh, but there are some posters that are very interesting, like this one with the character Fu, and uh, uh, depicting the, uh, the, the scene of uh, the birth of Jesus. It's, it's, it's very nice. Okay, now, uh, if, and then I go into architecture, but let, let, me, let me jump in that to the modern period. Do I still have a, another five minutes? Another five minutes, okay. Uh, so in the present situations, uh, with the younger generation of Chinese Catholics in their teens and 20s, like their non-Christian peers, are part of the global world and do not carry the scars of the Cultural Revolution. They still like the old iconography, but they feel at ease in a Gothic as well as in a modern church, Chinese style. And at mass, or when they gather together to pray and socialize, they prefer Christian songs and dances with a modern beat, like those. So this is the Catholic youth today, especially in the, in the city. So they have fully embraced the reform of Vatican II and its implications. And they are also increasingly involved, and this has been already presented by uh, Bishop Yang in particular, uh, in social and charitable activities, such, such as the Rich Chi Volunteer Program, uh, the Aid and Prevention Care, and a lot more, just like the Liming. So if the elders aim primarily at preserving Christian values in the face of oppressions, the new generation, at least in the part of the open church, um, they seem more willing to openly witness their faith in the civil society. Let me skip a few of the things here. Um, in 1999, I, um, as I was uh, coming to, to Hong Kong, I was invited by the Holy Spirit Center uh, to, give a, to give a talk entitled Challenges and Hopes for the Church in China in the Third Millennium. And in this, among other things, I stress uh, the importance of the press such as Shinder here, the, the importance of social service, such as Jinder, and the importance of technology. Now, you recognize that person there? <laughs> uh, and, and at the same time, I emphasize uh, the need for a well-trained lady. I think that has been my late motive in China, uh, to work hand in hand with priests and sisters as co-workers in the task of evangelization. And in that I was supported or I find a, 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 a good person to, to back, me, back me up in the 
in the person of Bishop Jin. In one of the talk on one on one we, we had together, he told me this, I, and I quote, time has, co has come for the clergy in our church to enter into partnership with the laity, not only in announcing the good news, but also in running our diocese. In the past, the clergy was in charge of everything. This is over. Now is the hour of the laity. Bishop Jin. Um, and I think Bishop Jin was right. And um, I, I, I think the church is coming out of this uh, ghetto mentality. And when I was at Merino, um, I had a chance to meet many of uh, uh, young priests and uh, not so young anymore. Some of them are in this room here. Uh, and they are doing wonderful, wonderful work in, in China. Uh, I would like to um, conclude by saying, but th th the task is not, is not finished yet. Uh, and then about a year ago, uh, a Jesuit father uh, teaching in, in, in the US, Joseph Yo Guo Jiang, or Jiang, Jiang Guo Yo Guo, rather to say, um, published uh, a very interesting um, article uh, called Catholicism in the 21st Century China, in which he, and here he had a quote, he asked for the Catholic Church to un further undergo uh, transformations, to remain relevant to the need of the new generations. And I, I think uh, uh, this, this is what is most needed today. Uh, the, the paper goes on uh, talking about uh, the present si situations and I, I gave my own take about uh, uh, Ben Di Hua and uh, Zhong Ho Hua and what is in unculturated theology versus a sinicized theology. Uh, but I think this has already been discussed quite a lot already during this conference, so I don't want to uh, insist more on this uh, point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Professor Jean-Paul. Um, yeah, that was a very uh, clear historical presentation of the theme, although you had to skip a lot of material, but then that could be taken up during the discussion. And uh, on behalf of Father Spadara, I would like to thank you for showing that slide on Civilta Catolica. Because yeah, he is the director of Civilta Catolica. So at least you have made one person happy in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> now let's, uh, let's pass on to um, uh, Mr. Fu Yude. Am I pronouncing it right? Um, he'll be responding to the paper of uh, Professor Jean-Paul. Uh, Fu Yude is a professor in the School of Philosophy and Social Development of Shandong University, founder and director of the Center for Judaic and Interreligious Studies of Shandong University, chair professor of the Shangjiang Scholar Project, vice chairman of the Philosophy Teaching Commission of China Education Ministry, vice president of China Society of Religions, President of Philosophy Society of Shandong Province. He's also the founder and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Jewish Studies. Uh, his uh, research areas are Jewish, philosophy and Judaism, history of Western philosophy, comparative studies in religions and philosophies, and the major publications are history of Jewish philosophy, history of modern Jewish philosophy, studies in Berkeley's philosophy, and then other series of articles on Judaism and Confucianism. Over to you, Mr. Fu, you there. Thank, thank you very much, moderator, and also a mediator between China <laughs> and uh, Rome. And uh, I would like to give a special thanks and uh, 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 
uh, to thanks to the organizers who brought about this important uh, event and uh, give me opportunity to uh, give a talk about uh, or give a response to a marvelous presentation uh, given by Professor West. I don't know how to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Instead of uh, repeating the historical facts and uh, summarize the, 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 the viewpoints, I would like to uh, directly come to the uh, questions. Although Professor Wiest didn't uh, raise, I mean, he, he raised the sixth question in his uh, written paper and I read it be uh, before the conference, and he, uh, in his presentation, he just mentioned one, the question, but I can, you know, I, uh, I may go, uh, go more uh, to extend my answer to his other questions, which actually I think it is uh, uh, extremely important, and he is very much concerned with. <coughs> and by and large, Professor Wiest raised the following two questions. First, is there any difference between enculturated theology and uh, synthesized theology? Second, how can the Catholic Church become truly Chinese? The second question contains two folds of meaning how to regard the relationship between the Catholic Church and the central government, and how to obtain, attain the aim of a synthesization of Catholicism in China. How, uh, to, to, to attain the aim of synthesization of uh, Catholicism in China culturally and religiously. As a non-Christian scholar, actually I'm not a Catholic, not a Christian, and I'm not from the, the, the government, so I'm just a, a observer, so I can only give my understanding or, uh, and my viewpoint of the uh, synthesization of Christian general and the Catholic Church in particular. Now, um, let me present a short response to the first question. In my opinion, inculturation uh, uh, and the textualization and the indigenization are very similar in meaning, but different in degree. All of the terms mean that a Christian insertion into the local culture and the society to transmit the good news, as um, Professor West showed the, I mean, the, the, the uh, words in the screen, transmits good news. In this sense, the inculturated Christianity in China is the outcome of preaching Christianity in the land of China with Chinese expression, just as Ma Xiangbo states that a conference, in the conference speech, we must use Chinese believers and the Chinese language to push forward the Chinese church affairs. Whatever scholarship or ability is Chinese mem mem members have, they have to use it to undertake the work of evangelization. In a word, the native cultures are tools to be used for the purpose of evangelization. Um, in his presentation, Professor West actually gave us a lot of historical fac uh, facts with vivid pictures. Unlike it, synthesize the Catholic Church indicates that the church widen and deepen its inculturation as two 
great degree to reduce its foreign and alien co color and make it a Chinese religion. I mean, um, during the process of uh, synthesization, the Catholic Church needs assimilate more Chinese spirit, Chinese value, and probably more Chinese rituals. <clears throat> Obviously, the aim and the task of the construction of Catholicism in present China are to turn the Catholicism in China into a Chinese Catholicism. In this expression to build the religion with Chinese characteristics, the stress is on Chinese characteristics rather than on the religion. The subsequent question is, for the Catholic Church in China, how to turn itself into a Chinese religion? Since the question is connected with the political, social, and the cultural context of China, I will try to answer it by discussing the three aspects, step by step. Much better. <laughs> uh, we should, among all, have clear awareness of the real relationship between religion and the central government in China. Unlike the separation of a church from the state in current West, Submission of religion to the government, Zhengzhu, Jiaocong, was and still is the real relation between religions and the central government in China. Letting the religions obey the state is the established state policy, and there's no alternative for any Chinese religions. It means that the Catholic Church like other religions, has to accept the political leadership and submit itself to the central government without condition. Mr. Zhou Xinping, the president of China Society of Religions, pointed out that as the Chinese government was always dom dominant, not only now, and every religion was and uh, compelling in history, the Chinese churches, both Catholic and the Protestant today, must also accept the political leadership of the central government without condition and firmly reject any action against the established relationship. I agree with Professor Zhou Xinping, it's not my own opinion. Does it mean that the party will indicate, will dictate the church what to do and what to be, as questioned by Professor West. He didn't raise the, this, the, the, this question in the presentation. My conjectural answer is not really. I used to, my conjectural, uh, I believe, and sometimes I say, I suppose, I, my conjectural answer is not really. As far as I understand, the established relationship between church and the government is pre in present China indicates that the lateral demands the former to stand with, the, with it firmly in order to strengthen the established united front to sustain political and social harmony in China. In other words, the party will not interfere with the pure religious affairs and impose the party's ideology on the Catholic Church in China. To allow the country and allow the religion, reflects the fundamental wishes of both the government and the Catholics in present China. Regarding the religious work in social level, President Zhu, Zhu Xinping, also, along with a number of other Chinese scholars, says that the Christian church should adapt itself to the current society. 
which is in the process of building socialist cause and realizing the great dream of to prosper China. By joint action and close cooperation with most Chinese people, the church will become a religion of the nation, People's Republic of China. I agree with the draw that all religions in China, including Catholicism, will surely adapt themselves to the socialist system with the Chinese characteristics if it wants to exist and develop it well. <coughs> Apart from the efforts in political and social level, in my opinion, the primary and the most difficult task in the course of a Catholic synthesization is its theological construction. It is important to fulfill the aim of synthesization without reformation. Without reformation, it is impossible to fulfill this synthesization without reformation within the church. How can the church make itself truly Chinese or enable it to be a part and parcel of Chinese culture? My answer is to reform it. Through dialogues with the existing Chinese cultural traditions and consciously, though selectively, integrated with them. Obviously, to, reform, to perform dialogue with other cultures need a guiding line, and to integrate with other cultures also need proper approaches. Now I'll take the liberty to, to say any, to, to some words about uh, the guiding line and approaches. First, the guiding line for dialogue. Several theories of religious relations are available. All we know is there are ex exclusivism, inclusivism, pluralism, integration, and comparative theology. Apparently, exclusivism on account of its persistence in no salvation without church, or no salvation without a Christ, and its opposition to, many, to any possibility to perform a religious dialogue can't function as a guiding line of a dialogue. Pluralism is also problematic because it contains every religion, it considers every religion as separate from each other and equal in value for the believer's final salvation. Imagine if every religion will surely result in salvation, as it says, the saying goes, every road leads to Rome. It is not necessary to conduct a dialogue between religions and learn from each other. It means that the pluralism cannot be guide, guide, guiding line for the church to promote dialogue with other cultures either. It indicates more tolerance than other theories and than other theories I just mentioned. It's useful for the church to attain mutual respect and the co coexistence with other religions, but no more. With regard to the theory of integration, I think it's a great contribution to the cultural innovation. It is great in the sense that it is so thoroughly open and liberal to any religion as to, 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 to be ready to learn from other religions and even to change Christology and transform Christ Christianity into a new religion. It shows great courage and the creative spirit to break the old tradition and build a new religion. However, it can't be the guiding line to synthesize Catholicism in China because, as I mentioned above, the goal of synthesizing Catholicism is not to change the religion into a non-Christian religion, but to establish a Catholicism with Chinese characteristics. The theory of integration without preservation has a threat to change Catholicism into a non-Christian religion. Apparently, it violates the wishes of the, both of the government 
and the Catholic Church in China. Now I believe that to revise the inclusivism by comparative theology is con acceptable for, Catholic Church, for Catholic Church to synthesize itself. According to the theory of inclusivism, Christianity regards itself as the ultimate truth or right way for salvation. At the same time, however, it also acknowledges some Christian revelation found in non-Christian religions. In this sense, the believers of other religions can be regarded as hidden Christians. If the theory is applied, the Christianity may coexist with other religions and open itself to promote dialogue with, with other religions and learn from other religions. The advantage of this theory is, on the one hand, to sustain Christian identity and avoid its being completely assimilated, and on the other, to have little obstacle to perform dialogue with other religions. Of course, it also has some disadvantages, among which one is its sense of superiority over other culture. If the church staunchly insists on its superiority, it may block deepening understanding other religions and the promoting dialogues. Therefore, it needs to be re revised by the comparative theology, theology. According to the advocate James Frederick, doing theology comparatively is a skillful way to work towards deepening understanding Christianity by learning from other religions. On one hand, comparative theology put roots in Christianity, and on the other, it is heartily engaged in diverse religions and enriches itself by learning from them. Now, if we synthesize both in inclusivism and the comparative theology, we would establish a mixture theory which will be more open managed than the individuals, in the inclusivists, and the better in self improvement by learning from diverse religions. This revised inclusivism could be the guiding line for synthesization of a Catholic Church in China. The reformation of a Catholic Church in China. Let us look at the type of a structure of a religion. It is composed of the three levels, the belief and the doctrine of the core. For the, the, uh, they divide the religion into three levels. First of all, the core beliefs. Second, second level is the value system. The third level is the rights. If we apply this mode of religious structure to analyze Catholicism, we would have the core beliefs and dogmas like the existence of God, creation, original sin, incarnation, trinity, grace, salvation, resurrection, last judgment, etc. And the general moral principles such as the love of God and love of fellow men, faith, trust, justice, and righteousness, justification by, by faith, doing to others as you wish to be done by others, so on and so forth, rituals in church services and the regularity of prayers, social customs, a set of rules of conduct of the individual or community. So far, I will give the structural analysis of a religion. Now, if we apply this structure to the uh, synthesization of Chinese Catholicism, I would like to suggest, first of all, according to the guiding line of inclusive, inclusivism, although you know, it's uh, revised by comparative theology, the Chinese Catholicism should keep the, the, the doctrine, uh, doctrine uh, there's no problem. I mean, 
then to some degree accept it, some values from the Chinese traditions like Confucianism. In Confucianism, we were given five virtues, a system of virtue. Ren, humanity, righteousness, <coughs> propriety, wisdom, and the faithfulness, you know, and the other val val values. Maybe Christianity, including Catholicism, can uh, 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 absorb some of the values to enrich itself. So in, 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 the, in the second level, and to uh, synthesize Catholic, Catholic values. In the third level, the third level, I think it is, uh, there's a lot of work to do, to, to do is to change the rituals. Uh, historically, you know the the, the right controversy. The some change happened to the uh, rituals and the uh, rights. And uh, Mato uh, some other scholars mentioned that um, because of his uh, renovation innovation, uh, he 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 won a lot of uh, converts converts. But later the policy changed. But in this level, I think the Catholic can do a lot of work to, to synthesize itself. Um, you know, I have done a research of Judaism for some years, and from my experience and from my uh, research, I learned that Jewish, modern Jews changed the, the, the traditional Judaism by reforming uh, the Orthodox, you know, the, the traditional Judaism, mainly reform the rituals. I mean, the third level of the religious structure. You know, I gave you the structure of the three levels, and the Jews, well, the, even the reformer, the reformers preserve the basic value: God, Torah, and the Israel, the chosen people, or something like that. But then they change the, the rituals. They give up circumcision. They give up the dietary law and some other rituals in the synagogue. So in this way, they fulfill the transformation from modern times to modern to to to, to, to modernity. So it inspired me that if Catholicism in China want to synthesize synthesize it itself and be, uh, turn it into a modern religion, I think we can also learn something from the reformation of Judaism uh, from the guiding line from the uh, reformation on the three levels of the, stru of the structure, mainly the ritual level. I think it's my th response. I it's not finished, but I think it's time is uh, over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fu Yude. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a wonderful response. And perhaps um, you maintained your response within this whole paradigm of exclusivism inclusivism and pluralism, although now that whole paradigm is, is so very much debatable. But all the same, we are talking about comparative religions, we are talking about comparative theologies, we are talking about learning from other religions. And even uh, uh, Professor Jean Paul uh, mentioned something very interesting, which I would just like to comment upon, or probably it could also be a question and which even you touched upon a little bit. Um, you are talking about Christianity, the cross coming out of that image, the cross coming out of the lotus of Buddhism to embrace Taoism. Um, now in this whole struggle of, um, let's say interreligious dialogue, comparative theologies, inculturation, etc., cetera, are you, um, are you hinting at and embrace, or let's say that Christianity must embrace Buddhist and Taoist aspects. And uh, is this something uh, so very easy or probably, let's say, it could also be dangerous. 
So uh, do you see this aspect uh, of, uh, of inculturation where when we um, embrace themes of other religions, it could perhaps destroy our faith, but that destruction, we need not be uh, fearful about that destruction. Probably it will lead us to a new kind of a faith as um, uh, Christianity could, you know, uh, have a certain newness in, in this kind of a dialogue. But then if at all we are talking about resurrection, we don't, do we find resurrection in other religions? And if we have to really go and embrace other religions, perhaps we may have to just think of resurrection as a mere symbol. I don't know, have I, have I placed my question? Yeah. Okay. Please. Yes. Um, no, I, 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 I don't see a danger there, really. I, I think there is always something to learn from other religions. And in fact, it leads to the deepening of your own faith. At least that's my experience, having lived in China and being in contact with other trends, even from the philosophical point of view. I always learn for something. And I think in that image that you refer to is uh, Christianity is not shedding everything. It's, it's just embracing what is good in those other religions and taking it within itself in order for you gain a better understanding what it means to be a Christian. It's not throwing things out, but taking as much as possible. And, but in that same process, the other one is also receiving you and embracing of what you are. So th there is that there is that, that exchange going on. And out of the dialogue, hopefully the Buddhist becomes a better Buddhist and I become a better Christian without any exclusion of one another. No, that's, that's a wonderful response. I think, yeah, that's precisely one of the goals of interreligious dialogue where while you're learning, you're also teaching. And at the same time, in this kind of a cross-fertilization, Every religion is learning something. It's just not Christianity that's learning. So anyway, um, uh, now I shall, I shall open it up to the floor. If any one of you has any comment to make or any question to be asked, any reflection to make, please feel free to do so. Uh, well, in these two days, I'm really learning a lot. And it opened me to some reflections, which I will say expresses in a very, very simple words, and, and I would be grateful if you would further comment on it. M maybe it seems that we are uh, focusing on uh, religions like Christianity, Buddhism, and so on. But could, could we, is it possible that we switched our perspective onto the believers of these religions, because in interreligious dialogue, we don't dialogue with Buddhism, we don't dialogue with Islam. We, 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 we encounter and we have to deal with people, the believers of these religions, and also taking into mind also uh, people with good faith, because otherwise from the start we are excluding a large portion of humanity. And I think in China it is pro proportionally also a great lot. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, w w I think we are on a parallel way, but we are living from, we are uh, departing from the west towards the east, and on the other hand, from the east towards the west. Uh, I, I'm saying that I have many Italian friends, they declare and they claim themselves to be Buddhist or Hindus, but these friends are very, very Italian. For example, they will just quote uh, what Pope, Pope, Pope uh, Francis say. Maybe when we are programming some events, they will say, maybe not on Sunday because the Christians would have to uh, attend mass, so they, they cannot come. So this, this kind of mutual respect. So in this, que in this sense, uh, we come to the question of compatibility. 
can I be 100% uh, Chinese? Of course, I don't have other ways not to be. And can I be 100% Catholic, Christians? Well, if I want to be, if I try to live uh, uh, the Christians, the Bible life, and put it in, in, into, into practice. Uh, so, so I think, uh, I think it, 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 is, uh, it is really positive. The last things I would like to say is that we should testify what we believe with our, with, with our life, maybe. Uh, the, the very, very famous proverb, Chinese proverb, above three meters above your head, there is God who look at you and he understand you. Well, that God maybe don't have the connotation of a Catholic connotation, even for me. But I keep it very, very dear in my heart, in my deeds, and my mind. For me, it can also be, also be the guidance angels you know, of, of, of that God. So, um, uh, so, so I, I, I think, um, uh, I think it, it depends on, on us. Maybe you will say, well, you are living in a, I, 38 years I'm living in Italy. Maybe you will say, well, because you're living in a free country, I mean, uh, a country where there is, doesn't exist a uh, problem <coughs> of religious freedom or so. Well, in, in this case, maybe I will, con I will cons console myself by the, by the words of St. Augustine's, well, love and do whatever you want. Thank you so much. So thanks for the reflection. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm Robert McCulloch. I'm of the Society of St. Columban, which was founded 100 years ago this year for missionary work in China. I myself have had no experience of China or the Chinese people in mission my background has been in a Muslim country. And I'd just like to inquire and uh, um, a point actually that I haven't heard coming up in, in the last two days is, is there anything in the experience of Muslims in China, Chinese Muslims, in the way that they're both Muslim and Chinese that can uh, speak to this conversation or this discussion that we've been having uh, in the last two days. The question is directed to which speaker? Uh, yeah, Jean-Paul. Professor Jean-Paul, yeah. Well, I think in a sense it depends by what you mean by uh, Muslim. Um, uh, uh, among the believer of Islam in China, I would say you have at least two groups rather different. You have some, the Hui people, when you look at them, they are 100% Chinese, and they are the kind of the, the descendant of early traders that came to China and established in China and live their religions. And uh, uh, they, they are 100% Chinese as far as culture and everything, but they still believe in Islam, they have their mosque and so on. So this is one type. But you have one type more uh, towards Xinjiang over there, that western part of, of China, where those people are more what is called minorities, although they are uh, 100 millions or so of people. Um, and they come from a, an entirely different uh, background. So I would say uh, they, um, uh, they are Chinese citizens, but they are not Han Chinese. And in their way of behavior, relating to the government, relating to other Chinese, they act differently, and the Chinese government is acting very differently uh, toward them. And this is part of some of the problems you have at uh, present in this part of, uh, of China. Uh, going to the point of 
those people, they are Uyghur or other type of nationalities, and they feel that, uh, quote unquote, they are being invaded by the Han Chinese and that large immigrations that come into that part of China. And so that creates some problem, some tension, some uh, rebellions, and some very harsh measures from the government. So you, you, there you have two very different situations. Okay, yeah. I'd just like to follow up. Does that mean that there's nothing to be learned that the Catholic Church or Christianity can learn from their experience? Essentially, bluntly, that's what I'd like to ask. Uh, I, th I think there is always something to learn. That was I was just uh, um, saying a, a, a few minutes ago, is that in, in that exchange, you should go from an attitude of dialogue, of understanding, and of respect. And there's also, there's always something to learn. That believe that, you know, if you are a believer and so on, they are believers too, that God is talking to people in different civilization and countries and so on, in their own culture, in their own way. So they have, it's my feeling, they have an understanding, a view of God for, that I can learn from. I always do believe that, you know, you look, you look at, at the world, who has a, a total understanding of history? Nobody has. Only if you believe in God, he's up there, he see it. I see it from my little angle and so on. And so you see it from your little angle. So by learning from you and you learning from me, we, we, we gain a better understanding of what is God. So the dialogue, I don't know if it's happened, but it should happen. The context of this discussion that we've been having, I, I, I'm as much committed to dialogue, it, essentially. But I mean, from the point of view of the, the topic that's under discussion, the topic of your paper, is there anything from the experience of people who are Muslims in China, of whatever, um, of the two groups that you're speaking about, that irradiates or shed lights on, on this particular issue that we've got under discussion at the moment. Well, are, are you trying to, I'll just clarify the question, are you trying to say that um, the way the Muslims have inculturated themselves, there is something to learn by the pedagogy or methodology, or is it that uh, there is a certain proclamation done by the Muslims I, from which we can learn? And I, I really don't know. I'm asking the question about people who are experienced uh, about China yeah. uh, from the experience to reflect upon, is there anything, I'm actually asking for information, um, concerning the experience of Muslim people. But it uh, could be experience China. of costumes, or it could be experiences of, you know, other well, I mean, in, in, in with religion, it, faith, proclamation, yes. that kind of thing. Yes, yes, precisely in the terms yeah. of the discussion yeah. uh, of the seminar. No, because inculturation could mean so many things, it could be a very wide kind of a topic, but, but yeah, in religion, you mean uh, faith yes, and... Problem. Yes, yeah. yes. The terms of the discussion that mm. we've got going on now. I, I, I think uh, Professor Fu, who is an uh, 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 Islam would scholar... You, would you like to answer could, this? Uh, uh, should be comments, able to answer that yeah. better. Hey, first of all, I want to say a few words about uh, your question. You asked the professor which about to <coughs> whether a Christianity can receive a, the concept of a God and Buddha, Tao, a little danger uh, to uh, Christianity. Uh, professor Wish uh, said no, it's not a danger, but it seems to me it is, is a danger if you stand in some perspective. If I were a Orthodox Protestant or a Catholic, 
I must say it is a danger if we accept some important uh, uh, faith or values from other religions. It is, it is a threat. But if we, will, we leave aside a particular perspective, we make judgment from the, some other religion or from the secular world, we could say that the danger is not necessarily bad. The danger means something, some crisis, crisis leads to innovation or formation. Innovation leads to, to change and to, you know, to change something old into a new, new one. So in this sense, it's an opportunity. It's, n it's not entirely bad. So this is my comment on your, 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 your question to Professor West. Uh, about uh, your question, the ex uh, experience of Muslim, in, in, uh, whether w you know, we have some uh, uh, knowledge or experience that in China, the Muslims also uh, self-claim that they are Chinese Muslim, or they are Confucian Muslim, or they are a, a Christian Muslim, something like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think yes. I have some friends, um, we were classmates, and I know them, they, 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 they are Muslims, and they eat pork, and they drink, and they do Anything like us, we are Han Chinese, and we, 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 there's no dietary law for us. Uh, he almost the same, but he preserved. He 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 said, "I'm a Muslim, and I went to the. Uh, sometimes I do a fast, you know, don't 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 eat in some particular day, and went to the mosque to do some service my, with my uh, family members. But they are, they they acknowledge." Well, Confucian is the good, and we have to be righteous. We have to be uh, faithful to our friends. You know, these values, they also accept these values. It's very similar to the reformer rules, and also very similar to the, you know, Boston, Boston School, uh, 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 Confucian School, Boston Confucian School in Boston. They, 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 there are a Christian scholars, um, uh, for example, both wrong and Neville, uh, Neville, uh, <laughs> they, 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 they said I'm Confucian, but they are also Christian. It's very similar. In China, you can find many Chinese Muslims. Well, they say they are Muslims, but at the same time, they also say we're, we're, we're Chinese, we're Confu Confucian Muslims. And Confu uh, I, I think we have this, anyway, we have this uh, exper ex experience. I think we have this experience in any culture. That lady asked a very good question. There's 100% Christianity or 100% Buddhist? No, never. We never have purely, thoroughly, 100% pure Christian, 100% Buddhism. From the beginning of Christianity, you know, the, the disputation between the, 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 the Jews and the uh, early apostles, you know, some inclined to the, the law, some inclined to some doctrines, you know, the difference happened in the beginning. Even nowadays, there is no 100% of this religion, these believers, the believers of this religion. Thank you. I think we'll pass on to the next question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Wies and Professor Fu for your very interesting uh, 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 talks. Um, my question is about um, enculturation and also the limits of theology. And I, I was sort of struck, uh, Professor Wies, by the, the, the phrase that you used referring to the stele upstairs, the, the copy of, of the witches upstairs, uh, in relation to Nestorianism as another form of Christianity. And I suppose um, I was struck by that because I suppose 
you know, many people, of course, would would regard Nestorianism as not another form, but not Christianity. So, I'm 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 starting my comment in relation to that because um, the reform. I'm tying that into what you were saying, Professor Fu, about the reform of Catholicism, or perhaps Catholicism might need to to change if it needs if it's going to be uh, enculturated in, in in a deeper way. But I suppose what I'm really asking is um, how to both of you is how how does how, the, how do two, two questions relate to this whole area? And the first question is, you know, what is the human being? In other words, anthropology. And the second question is, who is Jesus Christ? Um, and the reason I'm asking that is because I, I believe that Christianity proposes a sort of a universal um, idea of who human beings are, uh, which is always deeper than any cultural differences between Christian, uh, between between Chinese or, or any other nationality, so I think Christianity has always highly valued every single culture, but also has always slightly relativized every culture. And perhaps that issue of relativizing the the the, the profundity of and the depth and the uh, the, the wisdom of Chinese uh, culture is the key question when it comes to whether or not Christianity becomes more, uh, you know, popular or, or spreads or whatever word you want to use. So I'm just, I'm asking both of you to re respond to those comments, if you would. Well, uh, relativity is uh, <laughs> is difficult to uh, to narrow down or to, to, to circle around. If you take uh, the example of uh, the Nestorians, so-called Nestorian stele, uh, why did I, I stress, no, 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 I don't think we should call them Nestorians. Uh, they are, uh, you know, part of a form of Christianity that in fact uh, older than our Church of Rome. You know, the Christian went to Antioch and from Antioch they didn't move westward, they moved eastward. And so the Church of the East was much bigger than the Church of the West for a very long time. So uh, this uh, being said, what, what I admire in, in that stilly, and when you, you go through the, those 9,000 characters there, uh, the first part is the history of Jesus and presented in a very Chinese way. And then the second part is 145 years of history of, the, of that church. And it, I, I, I don't find anything, uh, any kind of relay to, 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 to kind of put down the, the Chinese uh, culture into it, uh, in it. O on the contrary, is that effort to, to put it in words that the Chinese will understand. And so it, it, it's very respectful. The question is, um, is, well, what kind of Chinese are going to understand that? I don't think it was meant for <laughs> the ordinary uh, people. So it was more for the more intellectual type among the Taoists and uh, among the, the Buddhists. So, um, so, so this brings, the whole question later on, why it didn't survive. And as I was saying, we are way in the West, we fall in admiration around, uh, in front of this stele and what it represents and so on. But the question is that, how deep did it go into the ordinary Chinese? And that goes back to your reflection over there moving from the level of the intellectual, the, the one that, that runs the things, and the way the ordinary people understand it and live it. And I, I leave it to this. Thank you.